Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug and welcome to my AP Chemistry course again. In this video we're looking at some more periodic trends and the first one that we're going to look at here is called electronegativity. You might remember this from first year chemistry. This is essentially a measure of how well an atom can attract electrons. There are some atoms that are very good at attracting electrons. We looked at, you know, examples like fluorine and chlorine and those and then some atoms just will hardly ever attract an electron. And we can think of examples like that on the left side of the periodic table that are metals, generally speaking. Now, let's look at two atoms to compare here. here. Let's try magnesium versus chlorine. Now, we're going to look at this in terms of those two factors that we learned about in the last video. That would be effective nuclear charge and shielding effect. So if we're looking at the horizontal here, the left and right, magnesium and chlorine, do you remember which of those two factors it's going to be? It's going to be effective nuclear charge, right? So for example, we can say that chlorine, it has more protons for the same number of energy levels. It has greater effective nuclear charge. That means that those protons are pulling in those outermost energy levels very tightly, right? And so, yeah, it's going to have a very high attraction. If there's a, an electron floating around over here, you know, randomly, let's say, it's going to be able to get, you know, sucked into that. And yes, chlorine will attract that extra electron very easily. On the other hand, will that happen for magnesium? Well, it, not really, you know, it has fewer protons. Uh, it has a much lower effective nuclear charge. So it has a lower electronegativity. Uh, in fact, as we have learned in the past, magnesium generally doesn't tend to gain electrons, does it? It tends to lose electrons. So we say it has a very low electronegativity. Now if we look at the same periodic table, but let's, let's compare fluorine and iodine this time. So once again, if we're looking at the up and down on the periodic table, do you remember which factor we're looking at here? Yes, it's shielding effect, isn't it? Not uh, effective nuclear charge so much. So shielding effect. And so which one has more shielding? Well, it would be iodine down here. It has more energy levels, right? It has a greater shielding effect. Now that means it's going to have a lower electronegativity, right? Because, you know, since that those outermost electrons are shielded, they're able to kind of, you know, hover a little bit farther away from the nucleus. And that nucleus is so far from those outermost energy levels, it really can't attract any, you know, random electron that's, that's floating around out here. On the other hand, fluorine, since it has fewer, fewer energy levels, has a lower shielding effect, well, that nucleus can attract the outermost energy level pretty easily. And if there's a, a random electron floating around out here, it's going to be able to attract it very easily. In fact, as it turns out, fluorine has the highest electronegativity of all the elements on the periodic table. Generally speaking, we don't worry too much about the electronegativity of the noble gases. Technically, they do have electronegativity, but we're not going to worry about them uh, in this course. So we can ignore the noble gases for this purpose. All right, let's take a look at the overall uh, trend here. Now, this looks very similar to a graphic that we saw in the last video and also in lesson four. We can see that electronegativity tends to be higher in the top right-hand corner and lower as you go toward the bottom and the left of the table. Let's take a look at another uh, periodic trend that we've learned about before in this course, and that's first ionization energy. And I know we've talked about this before, but that's the amount of energy that's required to remove an atom's least tightly held electron. So we're talking about a valence electron. It's that, that last electron trying to remove that. And let's take a look at the periodic table again and compare magnesium with argon. So hopefully by this time, when you see a left and right comparison, we need to think of this in terms of effective nuclear charge. Which one has the greater effective nuclear charge? Well, it's argon, isn't it? So since it has more protons, 
greater effective nuclear charge. You know, there's more traction there. So it's going to be really hard to remove that an electron from argon. It's very difficult to do. It has a very high first ionization energy. On the other hand, what about magnesium? Does it have as many protons? No, it has a significant fewer number, right? So lower protons, lower effective nuclear charge, that means less attraction. So you know what? It's going to be a little bit easier to remove, in fact, a lot easier to remove that last electron from magnesium. If we look at the up-down comparison here, let's say helium and xenon, both of those are noble gases, and so they're both going to have uh, actually pretty high first ionization energies, but which one is going to have the higher shielding effect? Because that's the factor here, right? Shielding effect. We know that xenon has the greater shielding. So, you know, more energy levels, greater shielding. So since those outer electrons are shielded from the nucleus, it's going to be a little bit easier to remove one of those, isn't it? It has a lower first ionization energy. It's going to be going to require less energy to pull that electron away. On the other hand, helium, there's almost no shielding at all, is there? It only has one energy level, so it's going to be almost impossible, and that's hard to read, but it says fewer energy levels, less shielding, higher FIE, first ionization energy. And so if we want to look at all this in a holistic view and just take in the trend here, this is what it looks like. It looks kind of similar as the, uh, to the graphic I had up for electronegativity, right? It, it kind of goes in the same direction. Higher toward the top right-hand corner, lower as you go to the bottom and left. Now, these are trends. Trends. That means that there are some exceptions to those. There are no hard and fast rules. We do find that there are some anomalies on these trends that we can, ex that we can explain, though. For example, if we look at aluminum and magnesium, let me just show you where those are on the table here. Magnesium is right here. Let me draw in Mg. And aluminum is right here. And so just looking at the trend, you would expect aluminum to have a higher first ionization energy than magnesium, having something to do with effective nuclear charge. But as it turns out, if we look up what the ionization energies are in the literature, we actually find that aluminum has a lower first ionization energy than magnesium. You know, doesn't follow the trend. Why is that? Let's explain that. Let's, let's use our knowledge of atomic structure to explain why aluminum has a lower first ionization energy than magnesium. Well, let's think about the valence electrons because we can explain this, okay? Valence electrons in aluminum, well, th there are three of them, and they're in the uh, 3s and 3p sublevels, and so we'll plot those in there, two in the 3s and one in the 3p. And magnesium only has two valence electrons. Both of those are in 3s. And so what we're saying is, you know, since aluminum has a lower first ionization energy, it's easier to remove this electron than it is to remove that electron. Looking at these orbital diagram notations, can you see why that's the case? It seems like there's a little bit more stability over here, isn't there? It's pa everything's paired up, seems kind of stable, and so it might be a little bit harder to remove an electron from magnesium, right? Whereas over here in aluminum, yeah, it does have the greater effective nuclear charge, but look at this. We have this, this lone electron here hanging out in 3p. And so it looks like, you know, it might be a little bit easier to kidnap that electron and to pull that away than it would be to do the same thing in magnesium. Okay, generally speaking, if you have a filled sublevel, that's pretty stable. And so here's the, uh, the explanation for that. The full 3s sublevel, that, that's a fairly stable state. So it's a little harder to remove that uh, higher first ionization energy. And for aluminum, you know, we have this one electron hanging out, and so it's going to require not as much energy to remove that. 
Well, I hope you learned something about electronegativity and first ionization energy, and that you have learned how to explain uh, how these work in an essay. If you learned something, please give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, then please subscribe to my channel where we're going to uh, continue with the full AP Chemistry course. Join me on this channel where we can c continue learning chemistry together.